It's about time to begin. I know we still have a few people trickling in from, from our meal this afternoon, which was, which was really, really good and well attended. So it's sometimes hard to break up the fellowship there. But uh, just as a reminder, we're, we're covering the rest of the book of Acts. That's the goal this quarter. Um, and we had made it through chapter, through chapters 24, uh, finished chapter 23 and through 24 last week. And just a, just a kind of a brief um, outline, a brief reminder of kind of what, what led us up to getting to chapter 25, considering uh, the history and things that took place. Um, you know, one of the interesting things as, as we study and uh, as we don't really, you know, a lot of us, we don't have time to, to take the time to go through it. Um, but it's interesting to me, one of the things that stands out is how many times and I haven't sit there, I, I counted it up a little bit uh, throughout study, but uh, exact number of times that Paul was ever put on trial. You know, when he uh, accused of something, how many times he was actually put on trial or had to go through this. And just in Acts alone, there's so many uh, accounts that we come across. But if you sit there and think just the current, the current state we're in uh, leading up through, even through chapter 25, began kind of back in uh, 23, chapter 23, um, in different things. And what we see is Paul, um, a lot of times uh, he's able to defend himself or give his defense, and then the person that's dealing with him hands him off to the next person or doesn't want to make a decision, so they hand it off to the next person. And we'll see that kind of continue uh, throughout the, the chapter today. But just looking at last week, we were uh, talking with or looking at with Felix, uh, the governor there, um, and in Paul's teaching or Paul's conversation with Felix, um, he had actually reasoned with him. We, we, we see that word a lot, reasoned or, or taught or discussed things that Felix was at fault with. Um, perhaps you know, uh, righteousness, self-control, perhaps uh, even some adultery between uh, him and his current wife. And so all that kind of scared the situation, scared Felix, and he's like, okay, I'm just going to delay this. I'm going to delay it. I don't want to deal with it. So we see that, that that took place. At the end of chapter 24, we see that there was a time of at least two years in waiting that Felix was replaced uh, by, basically by a governor named Festus, or I won't, we'll call him Festus because that's kind of what he's referred to here. And even Festus wanted to please Jews, so he had decided to leave Paul in prison. So get, with that, we get into chapter 25. And we're going to kind of break this up, and I'll, I'll read through, and we'll have some questions that we go through here. But looking at the first, um, first few verses, we'll look at uh, verses 1 through 5. It says, Now when Festus had come to the province, after three days he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay am in ambush along the road to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there's any fault in him. So we see, um, we see a little protection taking place here, uh, at least for Paul. It says, you know, when Festus went to Jerusalem, the leaders of the Jews basically asked him to send Paul to Jerusalem. Basically, send him away. You don't want to deal with him, we'll deal with him. Send him away. Uh, so what? So they could ambush him and kill him. You know, you could sit there and, and you could dissect that in a lot of different ways, but you, know, you go back to a few chapters, and there's, it goes back to kind of that hatred. Um, just the disgust, the, the person that, uh, you know, they don't understand a lot of times what Paul is teaching or they don't believe what Paul is teaching, so they're going to hold it against him. And so what better way to prevent him from speaking than to get rid of him, to eliminate him? And so we see that still taking place in this chapter. Verses that, the last two verses, you know, Festus said Paul would stay in Caesarea. He, but he invited the Jews to go there and accuse Paul. So Festus had the authority to hold Paul, like, as I mentioned, in a location for his safety. And, you know, which was in some ways you could say that might have been um, protection for Paul. It might have been just the way 
um, Festus wanted to handle the situation. But uh, it's interesting. In verse 5, it says, you know, he, he calls those together. It says, those who have authority among you. He didn't say, let's all go down. It says, those who have authority among you. Uh, let's go down with me and accuse this man to see if there's any fault in him. So he wanted to hear him out. He wanted to see what was taking place, um, to hear what the arguments were. What were the, what were the accusations? So moving forward to verses 6 through 12, it says, And when he had remained among them more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea. This is talking about Festus. And the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. And when he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove, while he answered for himself, Neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done, nothing, have done no wrong, as you very well know. For if I'm an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them, I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. So what do we have happening here? We see uh, the accusations, we see uh, Paul's initial defense, but we see, again, he looking at Festus. I, I kind of find it interesting that, um, as I kind of started out talking about some of the, the delays in process, that there wasn't necessarily a, a, a hurrying thing going on, um, that there were uh, things taking place, um, but yet, I'll just take this off. There were things that described as far as uh, time. And a lot of times we can, be, we can be familiar with timing take place. But what, what did it say? One thing I find interesting, it says after so many days, or after 10 days, or after all these things, what do these things equal? There, there was no urgency. There was no urgency to get around to necessarily taking care of, of li listening through Paul. Even though it seemed like there was, it wasn't. We see Festus sitting on the judgment seat to hear Paul. Another question is, like, how many times did Paul have to tell people about his pursuits? You know, it's, it's just, again, talks about the interesting thing we talked about before, but how many times did he have to go through this? We know that just talking about his conversion alone, uh, in Acts we see it a number of times, just talking about that. Excuse me. Verse 7, when he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood up and said, laid many serious complaints against Paul. If it ended right there, if it ended right there, we could sit there and say Paul might be guilty of something. But what were the words in that verse? Which they could not prove. How many times, and we can put ourselves in this situation, how many times have we ourselves been accused of something that we're not guilty of? I know sometimes as you know, little little kids, uh, siblings, and things like that. Um, you know, if you have one kid, a lot of times it's easy to know who to blame. And then if you have two kids, sometimes it's process of elimination. But when you have multiple kids, it's kind of like, okay, who did this? In this situation, you have people in high authority, you have people in high positions, and their accusations are. Are hurtful. They're spiteful. They're hatred. They're, they're, uh, you know, actively seeking to come and kill Paul. But yet, the I like that verse, which they could not prove. And my my question was, shouldn't have this been the end of it? Shouldn't that have this been the end of it? That should have just been enough to sit there like, hey, you can't prove these things. We're gonna let them go. What do we have in the United States today? <clears throat> When I've sat on a few different juries. I don't know if y'all been uh, willing to do that or not. Uh, if you ever get the chance, depending on the case, I would recommend you get a chance to do that. But what is the thing that the defense is going to sit there and the, the lawyer is going to sit there and say, this, the prosecution have, has to prove 
that they are guilty without a shadow of a doubt. Without a shadow of a doubt. Then they go to de- try to describe with a shadow of a doubt. They try to describe that, try to define it. And a lot of times, basically, as they said, if there's any kind of doubt, then they're not guilty. They try to, you know, calm it down. They try to make it seem like there's no way that they could ever be found guilty. That's their job. But here, it's even listed. They know. They know these accusations were not true. They couldn't be held against him. So why, didn't, well, why wasn't that the end of it? That was, that's a, a thing to think about. In verse 8, Paul has an amazing first line of defense. I like this. It, it, it kind of sum it up in that, this one verse. Neither against the law of the Jews, which that was, that's where the accusations are coming against, nor against the temple. They had complaints against him in the temple. Nor against Caesar. That was the other area. Like, like the Romans would be sitting there blaming him against things. If, you know, have I offended in anything at all? So that one line should sit there and even solidified it even more, saying, I haven't done this, I haven't done this, I haven't done this. Now tell me I'm wrong. And they couldn't. Verse 9, you know, you, you sit there and like, shouldn't that have been the end of it? But verse 9 says, Festus wanting to do the Jews a favor. Wanting to do the Jews a favor. Basically, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? Um, you know, because Festus wanted to please the Jews, he asked Paul to go to Jerusalem, be judged by the Sanhedrin in the presence of Festus. Um, it's just, uh, who, basically, where does, where do you, where's your favoritism? Or where, where does your, uh, you know, situation lie? Who are you trying to please? Who are you trying to prove to? And so, uh, Festus was one that, like I said, he wasn't always urgent. We'll see an interesting thing here in it coming up as far as timing. But as far as urgency, there wasn't a lot of things that really seemed to help Paul in the situation. Andrew, yes? A lot of times Roman leaders were kind of wanting to uh, kind of, uh, I don't know what the best word for it is, but to really satisfy the Jews try to honor requests from the Jews because they also knew there was a lot of Jews within the different provinces that they governed and they wanted to do their best to keep them happy. And so some of that might have been some motivation to want to do them a favor to keep them from getting unsettled and maybe, you know, they always were concerned about uprising. Yes. That yeah, that's, they wanted to keep control. They wanted to keep maintain control. And sometimes doing that meant appeasing their needs or desires or their wants. So, no, great, great point. Um, look at verses 10 and 11. It says, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For if I'm an offender, have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But there is nothing in these things in which these men accuse me. No one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. So basically, if he was not guilty of doing wrong to the Jews, basically no person could legitimately deliver him to them. That, that was his, some of his protection. We, we talked about this a few weeks ago um, as his right as a Roman citizen, that he could appeal and things couldn't be, uh, he couldn't be held in certain ways and he had protections against uh, situations that he was accused of. And uh, if you want to go back even where he initially talked about that was chapter 22 verses 24 through 29. Basically, he had the right to appeal. He had lots of rights as a Roman citizen, but he had that right to to appeal. Um, And so that's one thing that when you think about the history involved as far as Rome and the situation here and the accusations, he did have that going for him, Um, which we see you know, even within the different times that he was tried, or at least he was accused and tried, and then people kind of pushed him off. Some of that was because of his, his rights as a Roman citizen. Looking at verses 13 through 22, it says, And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, 
There is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, among whom the chief priest and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, It is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face, and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any, del any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things I as I had supposed, but had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there to be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to be, reser to be reserved uh, for the decision of Augustus, meaning Augustus Caesar, I uh, commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. So we see the introduction of uh, Agrippa here, and uh, Agrippa and, and Bernice, basically. Um, verse 22 says, Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. And he says, tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So here's kind of interesting thing. You remember I talked a few minutes ago about you know, certain days and after so many days and 10 days. And then when one of the Roman rulers wants to come and hear it, they said, the next day. It's going to happen quickly. You're going to, I'm not going to delay anything for you. You're, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, consideration. But um, we sit there and uh, you see all these things take place. And I, I talk, you know, talk about you know, maybe a slow justice system, but yet I like, like the, the phrase, there was a certain man left prisoner by Felix. You know, maybe not really forgotten about, but kind of just pushed to, pushed to the side. Um, it's just one of those situations you're like, we don't want to deal with it, we're just going to pass him off. But we sit there and it said, you know, with, I like that, without any delay, the next day I sat on a judge's seat and commanded the man to be brought in. Um, in verse 15 through 19, we see, you know, Festus kind of talked and reviewed the case with Agrippa here. And we sit there, we talk about, uh, we hear some of these things repeated, we hear some of these things taking place. Um, and we talked about, uh, you know, Festus even questions, saying there were some questions about the Jewish religion and a man named Jesus who died, but Paul says is claimed as alive. And uh, talked about, uh, Agrippa told Paul, about Paul's appeal to, to Caesar. And we sit there and think about all these things taking place. Some of that Roman protection or Roman custom was in verse 16. It's like, it's not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face. So that was one protection or custom that, that, that he had. And basically they have the opportunity to address or answer for themselves concerning the charge against them. So that was one of the protections that they had to be able to face their accusers face to face. Um, you know, Festus was troubled with, about Paul's case that he did not have. Basically, he didn't have a, have a case against him. Could not obtain, basically we see that word, any legitimate charges against Paul. And he needed charges. He needed these charges because Paul had appealed to Caesar. He needed these charges to be able to pass them on. He wasn't just going to send him and say, hey, people are accusing him of these things. I'm going to leave it in your hands. No, he had to have le legitimate charges to send them on. And so uh, here we're seeing Agrippa trying to help with that situation. Um, you know, he's going to come in here and he wants to listen to Paul. He wants to do this. So who was, we, you know, we, don't, we don't know a whole lot really about uh, King Agrippa here. I did a little bit of research, a little background, because this one's only mentioned really in two chapters, chapter 25 and 26. Uh, history notes this was Agrippa II. Uh, again, only mentioned in these two chapters. My understanding of the research, history says that basically his father, which Agrippa I, um, passed away when Agrippa II was only 17. People or the public thought he was too young to be placed on the throne. Uh, he was transferred about, given the title king after the death of Claudius in AD 54. So um, fairly new king in the situation, but 
but yet, like I said, there was some history there, but that's just kind of a, a side note as far as who King Agrippa was. He wasn't, wasn't the first, but he was the second. And so it's just interesting as we read throughout here, again, you have different people hearing Paul out. And the interesting thing that we'll get to, uh, that we've heard, already heard before, is Paul, even though it sounds familiar, it sounds familiar, he, uh, he hasn't changed, Paul doesn't change his story. Uh, Paul has the interest to, to give his defense, but in the meantime, as we're going to discuss here in a few minutes, what was Paul's defense? It was about why he was doing what he was doing. It was about, he was, when he gave a defense, he was actually teaching. He was showing others. He was telling others about Jesus. He was telling others about the service he was providing. He talked about his conversion and what took place. And so, as we'll see here, even with King Agrippa and others, in his defense, which is interesting, his defense, he was actually using it as teaching a teaching opportunity. And so it's just one other thing to sit there and think about all the different ways that Paul is effective in his travels, in his teaching, um, in his dealings with others, that even when he, like we talked about earlier in Acts, when he's in prison, what does he do with a jailer there? Through his faith, right, um, he and his family, you know, converted. Um, and so every opportunity, it seems like, every opportunity that Paul takes, whether it's defense, whatever, it's usually a method of teaching. Or, or those who are listening are affected in some manner. Verses 23 through 27. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men in the city at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are, present, who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found out that he had committed nothing deserving of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. Verse 26, I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him, therefore... I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not specify the charges against him. That's what we just discussed, but he's inquiring. He's, he's asking King Agrippa for help. You know, basically, I want you to hear this person out, and hopefully we can determine the accusation, the charges, the confirmed Basically, what we're, what we're going to send to Caesar to blame him with. And so, um, so it's not just you know, an easy ride, but you know, Festus is, is hoping for help here. So, you know, it's interesting, again, just to sit there and think about Paul's defense and the case. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting is if you sit there and think about the the different opportunities that Paul had to defend himself. A lot of times it was among accusers, right face to face with accusers. Occasionally it was maybe one on one or one in a small group. But the one thing I found interesting here is it talked about they had the next days that Agrippa and Bernice had come up great pomp and a great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and prominent men of the city at Festus' command. So you have this audience. You have this large audience, probably in some ways, probably because of the presence of King Agrippa and Bernice, but yet also, you know, here's extra witnesses. Here's extra people. Uh, make a great big deal about this. And so it's just an interesting thing to think about there. Um, and so... With that, it kind of leads into chapter 26. We'll see this continuing. Um, yeah. Yes? Oh, I can see possibly that, not knowing the Romans that well, but there's got to be some entertainment value here. <laughs> right. Here's Paul. Here's the Jews and Pauls having a squabble. Paul is one to take me all the way to Caesar. And, you know, Grimm like, well, this is yeah. Caesar. Nobody appeals to Caesar. Right. Unless they want the head chopped off. Yeah. Discussion about well, the Jews are saying, you know, the discussion about this 
Jesus who is dead, but he says, no, he's alive. That, that could have perked up Agrippa's ears too. Going, whoa, okay. This is, this is going to sit back. I want to watch. I want to I hear this guy and see what he has to say because God is doing uh, all the orchestrating of gathering people there um, to this, but just the appeal. And, yeah. I hate, I hate to say entertainment, but Oh yeah. For them, the, 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 the world is going, okay. You know, I haven't heard something like this in a while. Right. Let's yeah. Keep it here in town for a while. Yeah. And I'm sure you some of that draw was because the king, you know, everything was taking place there, just the draw of that. Uh, but yeah, to see the, kind of like I said, an entertainment value or or just what's taking place. What's the big draw? Well, yeah. Justifiable. Right. This guy up the road. Yes. Yes, absolutely. The one thing I, I failed to mention earlier, and just another interesting uh, study that I wanted to inter interject it earlier, and I missed it in my notes, but um, we talked about, um, you know, sometimes we think about, we talk about the days, number of days, number of things as far as things are mine, and we think about uh, the hatred, we think about uh, the Jews and, and different times throughout Acts that, um, that they wanted to... Uh, attack or kill Paul um, from from his conversion up to this point if I remember I counted right it was 12 times 12 times the word or the phrase wanted to kill him was used and so I said it wasn't just a small little bit of hatred a little thing that took place it was it was a constant it was yeah, enduring, yes. And even after being in prison or house arrest for two years, yeah. you know, they, they could have said, oh, well, he's done with, he's, he's stuck in prison. Right. But he was so effective before that time, and he was even being effective while in prison, that they were still, two years later, trying to, mm -hmm. we got to get this guy killed. We can't even just leave him in prison. we got to yeah. get rid of him. Yeah, you would think after that time, some of that might just kind of settle away, might go away, right? Just sweep this under the rug, it's going to go away. But there's still the dirt that's under the rug that's going to show itself again, right? Um, and so, yeah, and it, w hatred is one of those things, I mean, it's, it's dangerous, it's a damaging thing, it's, it's hurtful. It's hurtful for us, uh, a very dangerous situation, because we have uh, anger to the point of hatred in an unhealthy way. Uh, it's damaging. Is damaging. Paul was very familiar with it. The yeah. same hatred he had. He had the same hatred against Christians to the point of death, right? The same the zeal in that manner. Uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, but yeah, and and he, he recounts that several times throughout his writings. He he refers back to that. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just something to, to to think about and again just uh, you would think, why, why don't they go pick on somebody else? Why don't they go, go find somebody else, another person? And Paul was one of those people that, like I said, he was actively, he had been actively traveling. This is, you know, of course, after all his journeys uh, or his different missionary trips, but yet, um, you know, he, he's had an impact in the, in the area and he's well known. And so it's easy for them to harbor that hatred for him. So and you see, Paul is not living a Christian life just to satisfy his own wishes or desires. Uh, he was more than willing to accept conditions that were not just uncomfortable but threatening his very life, and it didn't deter him from what he was about to do. And that's something that's a powerful message for us: is are we willing to do that? Right. In this day and age. Yeah. There's. You sit there, and you, if you put yourself in, the, in that position, or it's hard to, it's hard to even think about that, but in this, if we put ourselves, if, you know, sometimes we think about, you know, can we put ourselves in the position of Paul or Peter or who, you deny Christ or different situations of people, of people that we study? What would I do in a, in a situation like this? And Paul had a lot of those situations that we could think through, uh, and I, I, it'd be very difficult uh, for to be right there and not sit there and like, I didn't do it. 
I'm just going to walk away, you know. But Paul was determined. He was eager. And then the zeal he had, um, even before he was converted as Saul, um, was equally, well, actually, it was more strengthened it was as his serving God. So. Another thing I was noticing is I think this shows God's providence in choosing Paul because he was a Roman citizen, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Another apostle who wasn't a Roman citizen appealed to Caesar. They may have said, who are you? Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like I said, the, the protections that he had were beneficial to him helping carry out the message even further. Because if not, he probably already would have been imprisoned or put to death. Um, and so that's, like I said, definitely. Um, you sit there and think about that, and then even in chapter 26, we'll see some of that account again and just some more information that's given. And Paul was chosen. Paul was a tool that was uh, very, uh, very adamant, very uh, wonderful opportunity. But, you know, God knew that's what he wanted. And that, that's a great point. So getting into Acts chapter 26, we probably won't get all the way through here, but we'll at least uh, kind of dig into it. So we have here, we, this is setting the tone again, in chapter 25, we see Paul is uh, in front of King Agrippa and giving his defense. So uh, verses 1 through 5, it says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of the religion, I lived a Pharisee. So here um, you have this, again, the, the background. You have the background uh, of Paul. And uh, I like, this, I like the, the phrase after he's given permission. It's like, I think myself happy. I think myself blessed is kind of the, the other way that the Greek word can be translated. Blessed. I, I consider myself blessed to be able to speak to you. And some of those reasons were um, because he knew what background of Agrippa was. And Agrippa, King Agrippa, because it says, because you are an expert at all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. So that gives you a little background about what King Agrippa was familiar with. So... Uh, he understood some of the struggles. He understood some of the uh, belief system. He understood the customs. But he sat there, and I like the, the end of verse 3. Therefore, for these reasons, I beg you to hear me patiently. Like, don't build up a, an answer. Don't say guilty or innocent until you hear me out. And so it's, it's just a, it's an interesting uh, opening kind of statement that Paul gives here. Um, you know, Paul pointed out that, again, from his youth, he had lived as a Jew. Uh, talked about the strictest of sex, uh, of the sex, which is uh, the Jews, which was the Pharisees. If you looked at a, another, uh, basically, reference to that is chapter 22, verse 3, which we've seen him talk about this already. But, again, like I said, you see this opening statement, which is already powerful for him. But, basically... Um, He's, he's ready. He's ready to give this defense, and he's, he's happy to do it because he knows his audience. He knows who he's, he's talking to. So looking at verses 6 through 8, these next couple few verses, it says, Now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise our twelve tribes earnestly serving God night and day hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead. So in these verses, basically Paul is stating he's judged for the hope of the promise of God to the fathers of Israel. Basically that, that hope, which is a resurrection from the dead. And Paul asked, Paul asked Agrippa and the others, 
why should it be unbelievable that God raises the dead? You know, he asked, basically asked the question. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's an interesting thought there. Um, kind of puts it back on him. Why should it be? If you believe God and God's powerful, then why should it be questionable that God can do this? And that was some of the arguments from the accusation against Paul by the Jews because believing in the resurrected Christ. And so we see this, uh, this, this, this accusation, we see his answer. And so it's, I don't know, we probably have a few more minutes, but yet it's just an interesting um, defense, interesting uh, way that he's addressing this situation. Like you said earlier, he's taking opportunity to make it about God yeah. and his son, not about him. Right, right. He definitely gives his background, but very little about himself. It, it's really pointed to what God has done, what, what he's been able to accomplish through God's working through him. <coughs> We'll try to go ahead and, and do the next few verses, verses 9 through 11. He says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Um, like I said, this is just a recount of the damage, the, the you could call it, I call it, I mean, negative zeal. <coughs> but basically, Paul's former, or Saul, Paul is Saul's former life, his pursuit. Um, and he sits there and, and he's, a, he's a recounting this basically and said, you know, even I made mistakes. I, I realized that I did these things and they were not accurate. They were not good. They were not uh, things that he should have done. But yet, he's doing this to relate to them. He's doing this to give them, say, you know, I'm not perfect. I haven't done all these things, but yet, I mean, I've done all these things, but yet where he's going with it is what he's learned from that and learned from his conversion. And so, the one thing, I don't, I don't want to step into this uh, too far before the second bell rings. We'll pick it up next week. The one thing, uh, if y'all remember, and we'll, I wanted to get to, we actually won't get to, but we talk about um, King Agrippa. What's one of the, I don't, if, you, if you remember this is the name Agrippa, in this chapter we get to the point where, in the latter part of the chapter when he's heard his defense, when he's heard all these things, what's one of the things that that King Agrippa says. Y'all remember? You almost yeah convinced me or converted me to be a Christian. That's kind of like what David's lesson exactly. this morning, right? Yep. Um, you know, I'm not going to give up. I went back and visited this person over and over and over again. They came. They were there two minutes and they left. And he was bothered by that, but yet it was, that was a celebration that he, that person made it that far. And so it's just, it just goes to show that when you go through here and we talk, think about Paul, think about Paul's defense, think about Paul's accusations against him, but in his life as Paul, as he defended himself, as he continued to worship God, as he taught others, that the benefit were the, was basically that God's word continued to grow, but that those around him were benefited. Well, and the Jews knew about Paul from long, long ago, because if you go back to Acts chapter 9, mm -hmm. when Paul was just converted and he's just beginning his ministry, he talks about how in his actions, his words confounded the Jews. They, they were perplexed. They didn't know what to think about him because of who he was and who he was becoming was this total, total opposite. Yeah, it's actually interesting because uh, in verse 23 of that chapter, after all these things started playing, this is the first time the word kill about Paul is used. Um, chapter 9, verse 23, And after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Already taking effect, already making an impact. And so it's just, you know, I, I appreciate, like I said, the comments and the, and the 
the thoughts there. I was trying to see how far we could make it, but it's, it really is an interesting study. So if you get a chance, go ahead and read through the chapter, rest of chapter 26. Be prepared for next week. One thing I was going to mention real quick, as we're getting throughout this, we're going to finish it up in November. We might have one week extra at the very end. And um, I want, if you have an interest, I have a very detailed, I have a simplified and a detailed outline of the book of Acts. So I'd be happy to provide that. If you're interested, let me know or shoot me a text or an email. I can email that to you um, if it's something you would like to have. And then also, like I said, just as we prepare for that, my goal for the last week, if we have the opportunity, is we're going to go and hit just overview, going back and hit the highlights stuff of the book, the last class. So thank you all again.